I see me up here frantically rolling, it's because I lost my place, so be patient. <laughs> Welcome to the new year. Well, at least the liturgical new year. What does that mean? Well, we're excitedly waiting for the coming of Christ. By now, we've already begun to see the bombardment of that waiting in the form of catalogs. With people in perfect PJs sitting in front of perfect buyers displayed, waiting for us to buy something. With television screens full of new gadgets and stuff, calling to mind the nostalgia of childhood wonder. We're invited to lean together towards the coming big event, when fantasies will be fulfilled and dreams may yet come true. We are invited to, to face such a message we're invited to see that. And I have to say, standing up here on this Sunday, balancing that message with the message of this Sunday was a hard one. It was hard to acknowledge that big event that is coming and still remain faithful to the scriptures, to that response, to that need for something big. It would be easy to stand up here and make a simple assault against the cultural and commercial messages. Yes, our culture is celebrating a giddy, overhyped pseudo-Christmas while we are attempting a more serious task of over-observing our Holy Advent. But the reason the culture has taken on this message is that deeper need to acknowledge something big is coming. The Gospel reading and the Epistle were tough today. We start this season with apocalyptic language. Now, usually when we hear these readings, churchgoers fall into one of two camps. The first group views the whole emphasis on Christ's return as much ado about nothing, or at least much ado about nothing believable. This is true even for the most avid of some churchgoers. They look forward to next week's reading, where we hear John the Baptist, somebody that we truly believe happened in history and has that great message of the hope that is coming in Christ. The second group, well, they're quite different. They tend to look at this apocalyptic language and they think it's the center of the gospel. So they look at the newspaper and they look for these events happening across our world, and they try to pair those up with the messages from the Bible. So these two camps, the first, that agnostic group, looking at the gospel, falling into a state of perpetual apathy. And those Christians who are focused on the last things are tempted to fall into a state of perpetual anxiety. But I would challenge that. I think that this New, pa New Testament passage and the Gospel are aiming us towards faith rather than empathy or apathy and hope rather than anxiety. Despite being full of language of the end times, Today's passage calls for us away from anxiety. The initial lines warns us against keeping an apocalyptic kitchen calendar. It says, about that day on the hour on, on no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. So, like the serenity prayer says, We must accept what we can change and accept what we cannot. And I would actually add, we should accept only what we can, can change, but what we can know. The other function of the apocalyptic text is to remind us to keep awake, faith and hope drawing us into Christian responsibility. We respond to God who acts in Jesus Christ who acts now and who will act in the end 
of time. As the next chapter in Matthew's Gospel will point out quite abundantly, we are also to keep awake to the needs of today and the needs of others. One, Jesus, one day Jesus may appear in the clouds, coming from the east, suddenly in, like a thief in the night. But before that, as Matthew likes to remind us, Jesus will appear just around the corner, suddenly, like a hungry person. Or a neighbor ill-clothed, or someone sick or in prison. Therefore, also, we must keep ready. So, for those of you who were here last time I preached, you know I love the Old Testament. And I often look back to the Old Testament <coughs> for an answer. And it's funny, if we were to set this up like a joke, the punchline here came first in Isaiah. The Old Testament reading this Sunday, these lines from Isaiah are Scripture's first words to the church in Advent. They are therefore the first words that we hear in Advent. Isaiah holds up a vision of truth. He takes us to a mountain and shows us what our heart actually is tuned for. First, he shows us that the Lord's house will be established as the highest of the mountains, and the nations shall stream to it. Here, Isaiah declaring that one day we can quit trying to simply remember the spiritual experiences, but God's presence will become manifest. Then the word of the Lord will go forth, and from that word will come justice. God will judge between nations and settle disputes. The word of the Lord will make an actual difference in the way that the world works. Inequities will be balanced and shackles will be loosed. Wrongs will be righted. Out of this justice will come transformation. Weapons of violence will be turned into instruments of nourishment. The nations will put down their swords and will no longer train for war. So it may be true that the idea of that new gadget for Christmas, or the picture of the family in the perfect PJs in front of the perfect fire is alluring this time of year. But Isaiah's even more so. The picture of, that Isaiah plans for us, the picture of unity and justice, of shared openness to the divine way, and a peace speaks to something at our deepest core. As much as we may long for a day when weapons are laid down and hearts are transformed and peoples are drawn together, we find it hard to believe that this thing could actually happen. Even to speak of the end times or of the time beyond time, when God sets everything right, is a stretch for many of us. In Isaiah's oracle, he announces this remarkable transformation, and he announces that it will take place at a point in time, sometime in the future. It is much easier to pin our hopes on Christmas gifts and the holiday feasts than it is to open ourselves to the idea to believe in, to hope for, to have faith in this peace. In our overconnected world, we can see destruction and conflict. Even if we never lifted an actual sword or an actual weapon of war, we see its destruction. We are a generation that has been disillusioned by our politicians, by, even by our church. We have seen divisions, more divisions than we have seen connections. And in this season, some in our church family are feeling that even more acutely. So, Has anybody ever heard of Stepwells? No. 
Well, I promise, after this, everybody's going to want to go home and Google it. Step wells in northern India, they have monsoon seasons. And during those monsoon seasons, they have torrential downpours, but they're very short. And the soil is very, very silty. So as soon as that rain hits the ground, it disappears. So around the time of Jesus, they began building step wells. They dig really deep holes, and they build up the sides of those holes, and they create stairs down. So that when the monsoons would come, they would fill up these wells. And as they would take water out, more of the stairs would be revealed. Now the original wells were really simple. Nothing more than a well with some step downs. But as time went on, they became more intricate. Imagine, if you will, an inverted pyramid. And about that size, they're enormous. When it's full, all you can see is a pond. But as the water is taken out, stairs begin to reveal themselves. And those stairs lead down to the water. You take out more water, more of those stairs are revealed. But they're not just stairs. Those people began to carve statues and even buildings in the middle of these. You'll see pictures of some of these step wells, and they look like temples in the middle of what should be a lake. And they're only revealed at the driest times of the season. I thought about that. And what I realized is that the people that built those step wells had to have built those statues and those buildings and those beautiful carvings at the driest, most desperate time of their lives. And why did they do that? They left it behind for the, those that would follow so that they would remember as they began to see those statues, that somebody else had been there before them. That the rains would come back. And I think that's exactly what Isaiah is doing for us today. In the end, Isaiah offers is not just a vision of global transformation, but an invitation to live into that day. He says, O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Now we may feel cynical and we may feel hopeless about our prospects of Isaiah's vision. But in, in this invitation, he lies an enormous practical power. The future belongs to God, but the first steps toward that future belong to us. Those who have lit God's light and are willing to trust that the rains will return. <laughs>